Welcome everyone. We're, we're waiting as folks are let in uh, to get started, but actually we have a, a, if somebody wants to go to the next slide, we're gonna be doing some polls if people wanna get set up so that they're ready to answer some questions. Uh, we will be doing um, some things in Poll Everywhere. You can join by text or in a web browser on your phone or your computer. So if people wanna get that ready, so they're ready to answer. And we'd love if everyone just wants to introduce themselves in the chat, say, who you are, where you're joining us from, um, that'd be great. And we will get started here in just a moment. Hey, Laura. Hey, fantastic. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I'm seeing all the great introductions in the chat. We have people from literally across the entire country, which is so exciting. Um, so just a, a few updates. So just to let you know what we're up to today, um, your microphones are muted right now, um, but we are going to be inviting you to share a lot to answer some questions for us and polls to share in the chat. Um, so we hope this will be a conversation. We're, we're going to be recording this just so you know as you think about what you share so we can share it with others. Um, please send us questions via the Q&A. We'll try to answer as many as we can. Um, and I realized I meant to start with introducing myself, but I got so excited by giving you the overview of, of what you needed to know. So I'm uh, Jen James. Um, I, I'm so excited to have you all here. Welcome. Um, I'm a sociologist and a bioethicist and an assistant professor at the University of California, San Francisco, and I will be moderating our event this evening. I've been involved in the wisdom study for the last several years, um, looking at some of the social and ethical implications of, of changing the way we screen for breast cancer. And I'm here tonight in this session because I'm really interested in thinking about the way, finding ways to make sure research is meeting community needs. So for most of the history of science and medicine, that, that hasn't been the case. We haven't made sure that our research is sort of aligned with community values and priorities, but all of the speakers who are speaking tonight on this call are really invested in making sure that voices that have been historically excluded from research are included. Um, so we're excited to have all of you here. I know that we have breast cancer survivors, we have people who have family members who've been uh, touched by breast cancer. We have advocates and community leaders and nonprofit executives and leaders of sororities and, and more. And you told us that you're here because you wanna learn more about breast cancer and you wanna learn more about how to share um, news about, about research and how to um, help different communities be involved in research in different ways. So that's our goal for this evening. We really wanna talk about the current state of breast cancer, research, we want to talk about the wisdom study and get some feedback from you on, on, what, um, on what we should be doing with our research and the best ways to engage the folks that you all work with closely. So we can keep moving forward with the slides. So as I said, we're going to talk specifically about breast cancer in the Black community. Um, we're going to talk about who's at risk for what type of cancer, what we can be doing better, um, share about the wisdom study, um, why we designed it, and if, if the ways people can participate and why we need everyone's involvement. And then speak to some specific ways that those of you um, who are, are willing, are here, able to help spread the word can do so. So we have a fantastic panel tonight. Um, so just to give you a little bit overview of who you'll hear from, we have Dr. Cheryl Ewing and Dr. Laura Esserman from UCSF. Um, along with Dr. Fumi Olapade from the University of Chicago. But we're actually gonna start by hearing a little bit from Ms. Valerie Jarrett. So Valerie Jarrett is the president of the Bar 
Barack Obama Foundation. She's an author, active board member of nearly a dozen organizations. She has a background in both public and private sector work, and she served as a senior advisor to President Barack Obama from 2009 to 2017. She's received numerous awards and honorary degrees, including being Time's 100 Most Influential People, and we're proud to say she's a supporter and a participant of the Wisdom Study and a longtime friend of Dr. Olapade. So, Ms. Jarrett, please take it away. Thank you so much, Jen, and good evening, everyone. I am delighted to be here for this very important conversation that we're about to have, and particularly just uh, very, very glad to be a member and a participant in the Wisdom Study. Uh, my mom has been diagnosed with breast cancer twice, first in her late 60s, and then again last year at the age of 92. And thanks to the amazing work of uh, Fumi and so many of her colleagues, she's alive and well today. But it's, so it's personal for me. And I know that it's important because of my mom's condition that I understand what my risks are and the risks for my fellow family members. And so for women who are leaders in our community, it is our job to empower and encourage women to focus on our health and the health of our communities. And the wisdom study is just such an incredible opportunity for all women, but particularly black women who are at greater risk to learn their risks about breast cancer and to take an active role in their breast health. Our voices and our experiences need to be included to ensure that the research findings are applicable to a diverse range of groups of women, not just a homogeneous group of women. So I am delighted to be here. I'm excited about the conversation. I look forward to everybody participating. I expect to learn a lot. I hope you will too. And so let's get started. Thank you so much everyone for joining us this evening. Fantastic, thank you so much, Valerie. That was a wonderful introduction to our time together. So we are now gonna turn uh, to watch a brief video. Wisdom is currently being featured in a series in Time Magazine, which is really exciting. Um, and we wanted to show a brief video that gets an overview of the study. Maybe, oh, was there an error? Hopefully we can show you this video live. If not, we'll make sure you all have access to it. You, you might be, if, it, if the sound isn't coming on, what you have to do is unshare and then reshare and make sure you click the box in the bottom that says share your sound. It's coming. Yeah, it's good. We got it. We're just going to quickly go through this ad. I think it just needs to refresh. Thank you very much, Valerie, for joining us. I'm delighted to be here for me. Delighted. Really thought I was. I had never really thought I was high risk for breast cancer. I don't have any family lineage or history of breast cancer, but I tested positive for a genetic mutation, which made me higher risk. They recommended I had an MRI, which did show that I had a small mass. It was malignant. That was the process in which I found out I actually had breast cancer. And I would have never gotten an MRI if it hadn't been recommended to me. I've always had this vision of the right treatment at the right time for the right person. Not every woman has the same risk. Maybe your risk is high enough that you should screen every six months or use contrast imaging in between mammograms. And then you don't want to torture the people who don't have that risk, doing a bunch of screening and biopsies and extra things that they don't need. So when you put those things together, does it really make sense to have a one-size-fits-all screening approach? I really call black breast cancer a different disease because the mortality numbers are devastating. We believe that there is going to be this profile that helps us understand who's at risk. Whether you're African-American or you're Asian or you're Latina, that profile is probably different. We need more research, we need more data, we need more women of color in the studies so that we can eradicate breast cancer. The wisdom study is the beginning of a change in screening. And I think people take it very personally. 
but I'm not criticizing screening. I'm trying to make it better. Elias Sirhuni, the former NIH director, actually said, you know, the greatest risk in medicine is to stop taking risks. And that you have to be willing to let go of the rung to which you are clinging if you want to get to the next rung. Such a powerful video. I, it's so great to see how well I think time has been able to start to sort of capture both the, the goal and the spirit of the wisdom study and the stories of some of the, the participants. Um, and yeah, it's, it's great to see. And so next we'd love to do a little activity. So I'm hoping all of you were able to see this link, which Allison just put in the chat again um, to, uh, to do a poll with us. So we wanna hear what comes to your mind when you think of breast cancer. What are the things that come up? I know we have various levels of, of experience with breast cancer, personal, um, in our communities, in our family. And what are the words that come to mind? And we'll sort of see what, what everyone is saying. So if you're able to either join by web or by text and, and tell us some of the words that come to your mind when you think of breast cancer. Looks like the poll should be open. Yep, it's just open. Great. I see a couple of people putting it in the chat as well. If you're able to put it in the link, that's great. We'll be able to see our words in conversation, but either place is great to, to share. Or Roshna, you can add those. You can maybe add those into the poll. I'm going to go to the poll now so you can see the answers that are coming in. Wow, so we're seeing scary, fear, family, survivorship, complicated. I think complicated is an important word. We're seeing things like surgery, stages, helpless, unknown, inevitable, trauma. Wow. I don't know if any of the other panelists are noting words that I'm not, what's standing out to them. I saw mom. Preventable. Mm. We hope that's the goal. Complex. Yeah, I mean, some of the words that I'm seeing the biggest, which I think means they're occurring most often, are, are things like fear, are things like scary. And I think that's true for many of us, but I'm also seeing survivor as a really big word. We know we have survivors on the call right now, and we know that we're making huge advances in breast cancer every day. But then seeing things like overwhelming, complex, um, there's a lot we still have to learn. So let's let's go to some of our panelists and think more about what we know at this moment about, about breast cancer. I'd love to go to you, Dr. Ewing, and, and think about um, what we know about breast cancer in the Black community specifically. This came up a little bit in the video, and I know that there is a perception in the community that Black breast cancer looks a little bit different. And I, I'm hoping you could say a little bit about what's known. Oh, you're muted. Cheryl, you're on mute. Hi, good evening. I wanna say hello to all the participants and thank you for being here and taking time out of your busy day to hear about our trial. I have, um, Dr. Esserman recruited me to the University of California, San Francisco, sight unseen, um, almost 21 years ago. And uh, we have worked together uh, since that time. And uh, I've been a breast surgeon for over 30 years and uh, I treat a lot of women in our community, African-American women and other uh, women of color. And I see firsthand some of the disparities. One of the things that I see, and in fact, this just happened yesterday, that I saw a young woman who was 28 years old diagnosed with uh, pretty aggressive breast cancer. And when I was talking to her, it turns out her grandmother had breast cancer her mother had breast cancer, two aunts had breast cancer, and a cousin had breast cancer. And it was shocking to me that no one talked to her or any member of her family that they were a family at risk for breast cancer and should be in a, in a preventative program and undergoing um, uh, increased surveillance. And one of the statistical facts, I think we have a slide that can uh, demonstrate this, the disparities of incidence and uh, of mortality of African-American women. So if you look at this slide that looks at breast cancer incidence in, um, in white women as 
compared to black women that's highlighted in the light pink, you can see the incidence is almost the same. Um, 128 um, out of 100,000 and 125 uh, out of 100,000 in black women. So the incidence is pretty much the same. But when you look at the uh, mortality, you can see a tenfold difference with a 20% um, incidence of mortality in our uh, in our white sisters and our incidence is 30, um, almost 30%, a tenfold uh, difference. And interestingly enough, um, when breast cancer is diagnosed with women um, under the age of 40, the death rate is even higher. And also uh, one of the things that, uh, when we look at triple negative breast cancer, which is one of the most aggressive forms of breast cancer, that incidence of triple negative breast cancer is also higher uh, in, uh, in African-American women, um, particularly at the younger age. We, but the, for most of the population, it's about 10, about 10%. And for our population, it's about 25%. So it's clearly there's a need to identify risk in our community. And that's why I'm so happy that you are interested in, um, in participating in this trial because we need to collect data for our community and how we can better address these disparities and also get out the information that uh, we do have a significant risk for breast cancer that needs to be addressed. So thank you again for coming yeah. to this wonderful webinar. And I look forward to um, working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, you know, I think you really touched it. I think that story of, of that woman who had such an extensive family history, you know, family history, we know is, is one of the risk factors for breast cancer, but I am hoping we can talk a little bit more about what we know about what are the things that, um, what are the risk factors that have been identified and, and how do we assess that risk? And Dr. Alupati, I was hoping I could bring you in along with Dr. Esserman and to talk about what are the risk factors for breast cancer? How should we be determining, um, how should we be figuring out who needs what in order to prevent and treat breast cancer? Well, let me start and then I'm gonna hand it over to Fumi. So, so who gets breast cancer really depends on your risk, right? So that there, and it turns out family history is one of those things. And that's closely tied to what genes you inherit, but there's also your breast density, how dense that tissue is which likely has some component of genetics as well. Age has something to do with it. Your race and ethnicity, as you just heard from Dr. Yuang, you know, has an influence on the type of cancer you're likely to develop, what other disease you've had, your lifestyle and exposure, whether you're taking hormone replacement or, or not, when you, if you had children, how soon you had uh, children, et cetera. So there are lots of things. And Today, you know, when we started the wisdom study, we did a study that suggested that we could explain about 70% of, of breast cancer risk. You know, that's not all of it, but and hopefully over time we'll do better. And what we do know is that hereditary risk is getting in, more complicated, but more interesting and potentially more helpful. There are these less common mutations that you can inherit that probably is what's underlying what was going on in the patient Cheryl just described to you. But there is increasingly much more information about the genes that you inherit, these small variations in, in genes, we call that poly, many genes, genetic risk score. And I think here is where the information about your race and ethnicity can actually be different. Most of what we've learned so far has come from women of European ancestry. Why? Because that's who's been in these trials. And um, Fumi has really you know, led an effort internationally to change all of this and has been one of the leading voices and has received numerous you know, international awards for the work that she's done. And thanks to her and her perseverance, she has been determined to help us find, you know, what are the types of the, the patterns in African-American women that could actually help us start to pick out who indeed is at risk for more of these dangerous, more dangerous cancers. So Fumi, I'm gonna turn it over to you to explain a little bit more about your work and your passion for it. And then why you think the wisdom study might help us, you know, 
advance and confirm your findings. Yeah, thank you, Laura. And uh, I really want to thank everyone who's showed up this evening um, for this webinar. I just um, finished clinic. I'm on the south side of Chicago. And I can tell you that half of the patients I saw in clinic today were black women who had breast cancer or came to talk to me about their risk for breast cancer. And so practicing in the diverse community on the south side of Chicago, it was a no brainer to discover that in fact, people came in in different shapes and sizes and breast cancer came in in different forms. And as we began to understand the genetic basis for breast cancer, it became clear to me that it wasn't about black and white, African-American or not. It was about who knows the risk factor and whether they did anything about that. And so what I found over the years was that people will come to me from as far north as the northern suburbs because they had heard about this gene called BRCA1 and BRCA2. And they wanted to know. They brought genealogy. They knew they either say they were Jews of our, uh, Eastern European ancestry. They came from Poland. They came from Ukraine. And at the same time, Black women in my neighborhood came and Valerie and I live on the same street because Barbara is on my street. And so we know each other from way back and our daughters played together. And so as we saw women coming from different backgrounds, we started asking what's genetic and what's environment. And what was shocking to me was the fact that most people think we have breast cancer because there's the environment, there's so many things that we can think about. And we always, and what I found really frustrating in the literature was when black women came in with advanced breast cancer, we tended to blame them that they just were in denial. But you know that we have a segregated society. We have a society where not everybody has equal access to care. And so if you have a cancer that's growing very fast and we tell you to wait for two years to get a mammogram or to wait, who knows, wait till you are 40 or wait till you are 50 and you're gonna get breast cancer at 35, I, you have no chance of beating that cancer. So that's why I started thinking about doing deeper research and my research started at Cook County Hospital, which was where I started my career. And then I wanted to tie back to Africa and then to ask the question, is it the African ancestry? Is it the environment? Or is it that we need to do more research? So that's why Laura and I, and by the way, she's white, but she's my evil twin. She got bleached at birth <laughs> because we are both passionate about really figuring out what is it? Because we're all one human race. We're 99.9% .9 identical. And so why do we both have passion about right. moving the needle and getting everybody to participate right. in wisdom? It's because we really care about women that the most important risk factor for breast cancer is being a woman. And then beyond being a woman, we then talk about family history and all of the things that Laura had talked about. And that's why when she called me and said, for me, we started wisdom on the West Coast and I want you to join and I want to be on the advisory committee and I want you to bring all the genetics research that you've been doing. But guess what? We only have 48 black women participating. I said, what? Where are all the black women in California? And that's why I said, bring it down to Chicago. I'm gonna get all my friends, including Valerie, and we're gonna get the Obama Foundation. We're gonna get all the thought leaders who really care about women's issue, who care about expanding access to healthcare, who care about health equity to join us. And that we have to show leadership that this is 
beyond us, right? And if we don't hold this, and if we don't bring everybody along, we are not gonna be included in the study. So I did my wisdom study because I asked myself, I'm a black woman. I don't even know. I've been getting mammograms every year, but I don't know what my risk is. I don't know whether I should get it every year or every two years. Why don't I jump up and do this work? Because one size does not fit all, right? We have different shapes of, and sizes. And just as we have different shapes and sizes, our genes also code for different risk factors. And the beauty of the wisdom study is for us to be able to personalize it for every one of us. And so just like Valerie took the test because she wanted to know because her mother had breast cancer, I really felt it was compelling for me to join Wisdom because I want to know, right? And we can be in solidarity with women all over the world. But if we do it, if we get to 100,000 in America and we show thought leadership on this, then the next decade, life will be a lot easier for Valerie's daughter, Laura, and my daughter, Dio, because these are the next generation of women that are going to be leading the way and we need to help them figure out what they need to do about their risk for breast cancer. So that's why I'm excited to join the wisdom study. So thanks Fumi and yes, it is true. Fumi and I are 99.9% .9 the same and so are our husbands. But anyway, just that slight difference in our skin tone. But you know, one of the things that I am really struck by in again, so you see Cheryl and Fumi and I have been treating women for 30 years. And you know, I think what we've learned about breast cancer is that the types that we think about, this is scratching the tip of the surface. We have lots more data now to know that there are, you know, more sophisticated ways to analyze tumors. And that tells us about the amount of risk. It tells us about the timing of risk. It tells us how fast tumors grow and the type of therapy that will provide most benefit. So if we can actually start to apply this in thinking about risk, we can start to develop the kinds of tailored prevention programs that we need. And I wanted to highlight something that Fumi said. You know, we used to blame women with big tumors and saying, oh my gosh, you know, how could you have neglected this? That is not true. Fast growing tumors grow fast. So if you don't know ahead of time who's got them and you aren't screening people appropriately, you're not going to find them with the standard screening. That's part, you know, part of what we want to do is do the best we can with what we know, but we want to make sure that we're learning and changing and improving. You know, my, uh, one thing I like to bring up is the analogy to heart disease, you know, that in the late 40s, a Framingham study was organized to really start understanding the risk factors for heart disease something everybody knows, you know, at the time it was a very odd notion, but you know, every internist can tell you what your risk of heart disease is. And we now have these intermediate markers like cholesterol and blood pressure um, to tell you, you know, to further refine your risk and have things if you're at high risk, family history, whatever that we, we have, you know, when we started, your chance of dying of heart disease as a woman was three to five times higher than your risk of breast cancer. Now it's probably lower. Why? Because they started by really understanding these risk factors and then honing in on the people at the highest risk. We can do the same thing, but we've got to know who it is and we've got to know the differences. And it's interesting that for an African-American woman, if they are at risk for a high rate or fast growing tumor, they'll do something different. But guess what? So should a white woman. And one of the things Fumi and I just learned is that the treatments work the same, whether you're black or white, if you've got a bad cancer, it doesn't matter what your race is, you know, but it's gratifying to know that the treatments work the same. So the research can help everybody. Rising tidal lift all boats. And so yeah. that's, that's why we really want to think about integrating risk assessment screening and prevention. And that's what the wisdom study is. It's that modern era trial to change this notion that everyone should be treated the same. Just before we move forward, Dr. Esmond, I did just want to ask, there were a couple questions coming up about if we know why Black women are getting triple negative breast cancer, or we know why women who are sort of 
doing everything they're told? Like, why, why are some cancers worse than others? Do we have ideas about why that happens? So me, you want yeah. to start? <clears throat> yeah. So the, you know, we talk about our genes and we talk about the genome. And uh, for those who, of you who are not biology majors, um, pardon me, because I have to go back to genetics 101. And the genetics 101 is that, at, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, we've been studying human migration and how humans left Africa and out of Africa, it went all over and evolved. And as populations left Africa, um, we talk about a bottleneck that allowed uh, people to, you know, of course, through uh, lots of hardship, they lost some genes, we lost some people, and then some genes are retained because they gave you an advantage to survive. So that's a modern migration out of Africa. And then we have the migration out of Africa, which are, are started as a result of the slave ship and the uh, slavery that took 10 million Africans or more than that out of Africa. And so by the time we get to South America and North America and the Caribbeans, we have a lot of what we call admixture where the genes have really been you know, scrambled. And so that's really the fundamental question that we're asking. Why is it that some women get breast cancer and it's estrogen receptor negative? What actually determines that? Is that determined by your genetic background or is that determined by your environment? And we've been arguing about that for many, many years, for decades, because when we first started asking about breast cancer and the different types of breast cancer, we studied white women and older white women get breast cancer that grows very slowly. And then it's often expresses the estrogen receptor. But one of the uh, uh, physicians at the University of Chicago, uh, Charles Hoggins, who was a surgeon, actually made a very important discovery that for men with prostate cancer, if he took out the testicles and removed the androgen, the prostate cancer cells died. And then the same thing for estrogen, uh, for breast cancer, if you remove the ovaries, the breast cancer cells died. So these cancer cells were dependent on estrogen and estrogen was feeding them. And that's how we came about understanding the estrogen receptor. And that transformed how we treated breast cancer. And for decades, that's what we talked about. And we thought, wow, we made the discovery. However, when we started finding treatments especially treatments that work for estrogen receptor breast, uh, positive breast cancer, we found out that there's some that were growing really fast and that they didn't respond to estrogen deprivation. And that's how come we saw that there were some that started off being estrogen receptor negative. Why they're negative? Why African-Americans in particular are more likely to have that? Actually is the reason why we are doing genetic studies across the African diaspora, because we wanna know what is determining that. Is it the genetic or is it the environment? And, uh, and wisdom study is actually gonna help us figure that out because we now have risk alleles that predict estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. And we were able to find those risk alleles because we started off by studying African ancestry women. By doing that, we were able to at least uncover some of what is common between black and white, women who get ER negative breast cancer, and then what is very unique and very different and allows you to get ER positive breast cancer. And so part of what we wanna answer with wisdom is which women are at risk for the aggressive ER negative breast cancer. If we don't find those women, we're gonna still continue to find women suddenly wake up and one day they have advanced breast cancer. Yeah. So that's why it's really important that we do this study, 100,000 women 
and that we find more women of African ancestry to participate because that would allow us then to figure out what are the determinants of ER negative breast cancer and ER positive breast cancer. So that's a long story short, but it's really a very complex question. And that's why we want black women to be part of the solution. And one of the questions was that why, you know, you know, you know, why is it taking so long to come up with with genes that are more associated with African American women, and I mean uh, that uh, that uh, with, with cancer in African American women, and part of it is that I think there has been um, a general distrust of the system and unwillingness to be part of studies, and I, I think it's important to realize that this is why it's good to be part of studies actually that you know that you learn more you make sure that you are represented and that we learn more and you know if you're white or you're hispanic if you're brown you're black you're you know whatever color you are if you're at risk for a, for a triple negative breast cancer it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is but certain kinds of cancer are more common in some populations but everyone benefits when we learn from it and it is important that you know, the more diverse we have in the community, the more likely we are to find the things that really matter. So that's really why this study is really a large, it has to be large, you know, so that we can have new data and a new personalized approach. And, you know, a lot of people think that screening every year is the standard and then that's gonna get us to the right place. But in fact, you know, 40,000 women a year are still dying of breast cancer despite annual screening. So I think we can do better. So um, we are trying to integrate into the study breast health education and preventive options. If we can identify people at high risk, you know, you know, still even in the African American community, more women are at risk for hormone positive breast cancer. So, and those are cancers that if you're at high risk for those, you're at we know how to do a good job of reducing your risk for that. So that is really what we're about, and. Um, uh, uh, and this is the beginning, not the end. And if it turns out that we're really good at finding people at, who are at risk for these aggressive cancers, we can actually get people to start earlier and get screened earlier and um, easy to participate in the study. It's all online. You don't have to come into any particular center. You can use a, mobile, a phone, a tablet, computer. Uh, we ask at the beginning, are you willing to be assigned by chance to either the annual screening arm or the personalized arm? Um, if you're not sure which to do, it's best to allow the trial to assign you because we learned there's certain information we can only learn that way. But if you feel really strongly that you either want to be in the personalized arm or you want an annual that you want to come in every year for a, a mammogram, then choose the arm that you want to participate in and we learn from everybody. Um, everything we do is online. If we do the personalized kit, we just send a little spit kit. It just shows up in your mailbox. You open it up, follow the instructions, spit into it, put it back in the mailbox. About a month later, five weeks later, we give you your information and it all comes back online. Um, and what we do is we send a screening assignment and um, report this to, your, to the portal that you create when you join the study. And we just ask that you follow the recommendations on when to start, how often to screen and with what modality. And all of the recommendations at this juncture are within one of the national guidelines, which by the way, they differ quite a bit, um, uh, but it's all within one of the, nat the national guidelines to start. And as we learn, we'll be able to evolve and, and make them more tailored and more and, and better. Um, so yeah. it's open to women, between 40 and 74 years of age, you have to live in the United States and you can't have had breast cancer. This is a screening and prevention trial. Thank you so much. And you know, actually before we move on, I was hoping Valerie, you might just say a word for a minute about your experience and what it's been like for you to participate in WISDOM. Well, first of all, anytime Fuli Olapati asks me to do something, I say yes. <laughs> um, this is a physician who lives down the block from me, as she said, who plays house calls on my mother all the time. On her way to work, she walks by and she drops in and she checks on my mother. So she is an old school doctor. She's not even the primary um, oncologist who's supervising my mom, treating my mom, but she's 
a friend. And so when she called and she said, look, Valerie, you are at a higher risk. You should take a look at this. And immediately I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to have to do? It's going to be hard. And she said, no, trust me. It's very simple. They'll send you a kit. And I'm like, oh, I got to figure it out and then send it back in. And ay, ay, ay. and then I did it and it couldn't have been easier. Yeah, I mean, really. And I am the person who's not like good at technology. I'm not good at any of that kind of stuff. And I figured it out just like that because the instructions were so simple and so clear and I sent it back and I did as you said within a month got a response back and am forever grateful and so for anyone who's hesitant it's easy and so isn't your health worth it isn't it it takes a couple of minutes of your life to make sure that you know and are equipped to protect your life and so I'm a big proponent of the study I'm glad to be a participant and that's why I wanted to be here with everyone this evening. So you would say anybody out there who's like, oh, this is too much, it's gonna be hard. Trust me, it's simple and it's worth it. Thank you so much. That's great. And so, you know, thanks for sharing your experience participating in research. We wanna sort of hear from the whole group, from, you know, from all the people listening, what they sort of think about when they think about participating in research. So you can go back to the same length, same tab you had open before it should switch to a new question. I'm curious what words come to mind when folks think about just being in research themselves, think about others, they think about on a community level, um, what this means. And, and I actually sort of wanted to, to touch back to something that Dr. Esterman said earlier and actually push back a little bit. Um, Dr. Esterman, you sort of mentioned trust as a, as a reason why people haven't participated in, in genetics and genomics, why you've been slower to sort of build up the, the databases. But I think a lot of research has actually shown that people of color have been offered the chance to participate less often. It's not necessarily that black women aren't willing to do this, it's that they're not asked. So I, I think that's so important to highlight that we don't really know, I think, what many communities are willing to do because for so long research hasn't been engaging them. Yeah, so if I may just jump on that because I, I know that Valerie has been really generous with her time and she's jumping on it and it's personal for her. But one of the things that I also learned was from you know, uh, the uh, former first lady, uh, Michelle o Obama, who was the vice president for community affairs at the University of Chicago before she went to the White House. And the one lesson she taught me was that don't always say that they don't have, they don't participate. It's really because you don't go and ask them. And so when we started at genomic studies, we would do community engagement. We would talk to the pastors and all that. And invariably, Anytime you ask a black woman to participate, it's like, where do I stand, right? And the reason why they didn't participate is because nobody asked them. And as I was coming out of clinic today, I ran into my recruiter. God bless Brenda, right? Brenda has been working with us. She's a black woman who is passionate about doing research that impacts black women. And she said to me, she said, for me, I've been coming to work every day. I'm not an essential worker, but you guys are working. The surgeons are back and I've been back even in a pandemic recruiting for us to be able to learn why black women get breast cancer and why we have such disparity. And because of the work that people like her do every day on the South side of Chicago, that's why I'm confident that it's not black and white. It's about reaching out, letting people in our community know about this. And when they know about it, they're gonna be part of the solution. And so I was really pleased when Laura brought wisdom to Chicago and people like Brenda, uh, people who work in our hospital, we're gonna do outreach, we're gonna mobilize them and we're gonna give testimonies of why the research that really basically started by black women going when I went from church to church and asked you know Pastor Brazier and other people in our community to support my research they did that's now what is leading us into this new direction and we're bringing it back home so that black and brown women and all of us on the south side west side wherever we are in the country because all my girlfriends now went to of course you know, Michelle became the first lady, Valerie. They all went to Washington, but I was like, stayed behind because this research is important for us. Mm -hmm. And it's really wonderful that the Obama Foundation has come back to Chicago 
and they want to mobilize leaders across the country, across the world, so we can start solving problems uh, that impact communities. And whether the communities are rich communities or low resource communities, we have to do this in solidarity. Triple negative breast cancer basically is estrogen receptor negative, progesterone receptor negative, and HO2 negative. It means we need to use chemotherapy. When we get it early, we can cure it. The problem is if you don't know you have a risk and then suddenly by the time you come in, it's advanced, then I'm a medical oncologist. I have a harder time curing it. Laura is a surgeon and she has a harder time curing it. That's why it's really important for us to get this word out, prevent the ones that we can prevent, and then catch the cancers early when they are most likely to be cured. Can I just double down on what Fumi just said? Because I think the importance of a trusted messenger makes all of the difference. I did it because I trust Fumi. Fumi has gone out into the community, which is something that historically University of Chicago wasn't as good at doing. But because she's out there and people know her, when she says you should do this, they believe her and they do it. And so there's no shortcut here. And if without the trust factor for a whole uh, host of legitimate historical reasons, black people will be less likely to participate, but they also have to be asked by somebody they trust. And if they're asked by somebody they trust, well, of course they'll participate because it's logical. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I was just making a comment in the chat that, you know, we have another study that Fumi and I both worked on, the iSpy study, we really have found new treatments for, you know, triple negative breast cancer, some of these aggressive breast cancers. There's no question in my mind in the next five years, we're going to dramatically change the outcomes for people with these aggressive cancers. But that should give us that gives us the clues for how we can start to think about reducing the risk, but we've got to be able to know who's at risk for it. And so we have to start, this is the path forward, you know, starting with what you know, continuing to learn, continuing to improve and getting there. That's what we did in cardiology. We are going to do it in breast cancer. And if you get out there and help us, we can all do it together. Fantastic. You know, I, I just wanted to touch on some of the words we're seeing on the screen. I know everyone can see this, but you know, I, I one that really struck me was hope, that research is a source of hope for folks, which I think is what everyone here is talking about, that there's potential for things like other words we're seeing cure and solution um, to, to adv make advances, which is really exciting. But there are some words here. Yeah. You know, a couple of people are saying fear, a couple of people are saying apprehension. And, and so I think thinking about how do we sort of address those perhaps hesitations in order to, to get the data, the knowledge we need to, to make this hope, you know, our reality, to make it what, what cancer um, screening uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and treatment looks like today. Um, so, you know, we're running, we only have about 10 minutes left. We want to just make sure we're spending um, more time answering a few more questions that are coming up and really thinking together about what are, you know, what are steps people can be taking? How can people be getting engaged? And, and what is, you know, what does wisdom need to know about the best ways to reach people that we haven't reached before? How should we be engaging in communities um, that have historically been left out of research? Hey everybody, this is Steph Goodman. So um, I would love to tell you about one of the approaches that we've taken um, the wisdom study to, um, to try and get the word out, um, speaking about what Jen is talking about to you know, educate communities about the importance of understanding your risk and understanding that there are, are different approaches to screening and what wisdom is trying to do to improve um, detection and prevention. So like over the past few years, we've been approached by different people that have either participated in wisdom or heard about wisdom um, because they, they may be breast cancer thrivers or survivors um, and they're unable to participate. But people have come to us and said, I really believe in what you're doing and I wish more people knew about this. Like, what can I do to help spread the word? So we decided to create what we've called this ambassador program. Um, it's still evolving and we're refining it over time. And um, it basically like provides a framework um, for in which we um, can bring people together and provide tools and resources to people who want to support the study and champion it. 
um, with the information that they need and suggestions on how and where to share this information. Um, so like, for example, we've had, um, you know, people promoting the study at events and gatherings, um, distributing flyers for us and emailing, um, emailing people in their network about the study and um, also helping us make connections with other organizations like faith-based groups, um, teachers unions and other groups that we can then do wisdom presentations um, to. And so it's really about um, educating people about what the study is trying to do and then empowering people with the information that they need to help share the, the word. And one of our ambassadors who's just been an incredible um, gift and asset to us who I want to introduce because she's on the call tonight is Ashley Deadman, and Ashley has um, a very uh, deep, deep experience with breast cancer and um, we, I learned about her actually I saw a TED talk that Ashley had done and thought I really need to speak with this woman and see what she thinks about wisdom if we're on the right track and if she wants to um, help us um, get the word out and Ashley's been amazing so I do want her to um, have the opportunity to share her story and to tell you a little bit about um, what she's done um, to contribute to our ambassador program. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening to the panelists. Um, so yes, my name is Ashley Deadman, and um, a little bit about me. I come from a family history of three generations of women who were impacted and lost their lives to breast cancer. My great grandmother, grandmother, and my mother had, and uh, my mother had a metastatic breast cancer and lost her life to breast cancer. Um, and shortly after she passed away, my father was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and I was 21 at the time, and so I was really scared. Um, because I really felt that cancer was coming for me and I didn't have any answers. I didn't have any, uh, I didn't have a game plan to protect my breast health. And so um, I, it was updating my, my OBGYN about my family history when that's when I was introduced to genetic counseling and genetic testing. Um, and it was that genetic counseling and genetic testing um, that led me to discover that I carry the BRCA2 gene mutation, which makes me at a higher risk than the average woman for breast cancer, as well as a high risk for ovarian cancer and an increased risk for pancreatic cancer and melanoma. And for men, if you're a BRT, BRCA2 mutation carrier, you're also at a risk of prostate cancer and male breast cancer. And so um, when um, Stephanie and I connected, um, I was really... Um, I was really excited to become an ambassador for a couple of reasons. I am a black woman. Um, and historically, when you look at um, African Americans in, in research studies or any type of study, there's a lot of trauma. When you look at Henrietta Lacks, when you look at the Tuskegee experiment, there's a lot of trauma that, um, that as a race we have gone through, a lot of medical mistrust and distrust and so when um, I did my research on the wisdom study before committing to become an ambassador, it was very, um, it was very, it was something that I really felt helped to bridge that gap and to address that disparity um, for a couple of reasons. Um, and the first reason is because of the transparency that the, the wisdom study um, shares about the study. Um, it is open to women um, from the ages, I believe, 40 to 74 who, uh, who are eligible to join, um, but it really focuses on a personalized approach to breast cancer, um, to breast screening based on the woman's individual risk, um, their family health history, their lifestyle, um, and that's what really stuck out most to me. And another thing that stuck out to me should a woman choose to no longer participate in the study, she has that ability to, um, to, to stop her participation, which I think is something that's very um, important. Um, and so really looking at um, the, what the wisdom study is about and what it provides women and how it helps to 
protect, what helps to help women protect their health and manage their health. Um, that's something that really stuck out to me. And so my time as an ambassador working and collaborating with Stephanie and Allison has been phenomenal. Um, I meet with them about once a month to strategize on how to identify um, organizations to be able to connect them to so that more women can learn about the wisdom study so that they know that there are other options out there. There are more personalized options out there. Um, and so um, I just, you know, everything that I've heard this evening, it just really just reaffirms and confirms um, my decision to become an ambassador and definitely encouraging anyone who would like to learn more and would like to advocate um, whether you're a caregiver or uh, whatever your capacity or relationship is to this mission, I definitely encouraging you to become an ambassador. Um, I enjoy engaging on social media, posting on social media about the different activities and the different initiatives that the Wisdom Study is um, participating in, for example, tonight. Um, and so I just look forward to growing in my ambassadorship with the Wisdom Study. And I appreciate Stephanie and Allison just for um, just helping me to um, first educate myself on the Wisdom Study um, so that I can be equipped to be able to empower others to do the same. Sorry, it's on you. Thank you so much, Ashley. We, we are so grateful for all the contributions that you've made and continue to make with, um, with us. And um, it's a very meaningful experience to be working with you. So I appreciate yeah. you. And I do wanna let everyone on this call know that, um, that I sent everyone an email tonight who's in attendance and the email contains a PDF document. It's our ambassador toolkit and it um, offers all the tools and information and suggestions that you would need if you want to share wisdom with others like social media posts and e-blasts and recommendations on um, how to reach out to organizations and um, we can offer presentations to organizations. But, um, but the, wisdom, the ambassador program is, is definitely a work in progress as we learn what works best and what is working best for our ambassadors. Um, so we definitely want to make this an interactive experience. And um, after this um, webinar, we're going to uh, send out a survey also to all of you on the call to learn from you. Um, you know, we would like your, your input on how to shape a program like this that would work for you so that we can have participation um, from many people. So we, we have questions like, you know, would you want to attend quarterly or annual or monthly get togethers? Mm -hmm. Would they be virtual? Would they be in person? Would you want to do strategy sessions? Um, another thing that you might be interested in is uh, meeting with me and doing a demo um, of our website so I can take you through all, all how the website works. Like what, what is it that would be meaning, would, that would make participating as a uh, ambassador more meaningful to you so that you can help us shape the program. We also have been doing features on our website, like the Women of Wisdom features. So it's an opportunity to feature our ambassadors and kind of tell the world about your work and, and your perspectives uh, on this information. And I, I also, I just wanted to take a minute to thank um, Karen Francois and Sharon Bell for working so hard to get this set up and um, to working with the AKA sorority groups and, and, and others and encouraging people to attend. So Karen and Sharon, thank you so much for your interest in all this and willingness to help and participate. Karen, are you still on? She might be muted actually. Yeah. Anyway, I want to, Karen and I have been friends for gosh, about 25 years. So um, I really appreciate uh, her neighbors actually. And yeah. uh, I appreciate her friendship and, and willingness and Sharon, her sister Sharon too. It's very personal. Yep. 
you know, we're, we're basically out of time, but I did, I, well, I wanted to thank everyone and thank all of our participants, thank our wonderful panelists. We're getting some great ideas of folks who should be engaging. I apologize if you can hear my screaming two-year-old in the background who just got home from daycare, <laughs> but a couple, a couple questions are coming up. I did just hope that maybe Laura could address in just the last minute. There's questions coming up about age to start screening and concerns that black women should perhaps be starting sooner. And then also concerns about people who might not be comfortable screening less often than every other year. So how should those people think about the wisdom study and how is the wisdom study addressing those concerns? I, I, exactly. Um, so this particular study is to start learning about women. So at the age of 40, which is when we screen most women, uh, that's what we would suggest. So that's why it's organized for 40 women, 40 to 70. If this study determines that uh, a more personalized approach is just as safe and in fact, you know, leads to better outcomes. Uh, what I think will happen is that we probably will start our risk assessment process for women when they're about 30. And then you'll be able to identify those people the one time who need to start screening earlier. Um, but we can't start because everyone, most women in their 30s have very low risk for breast cancer. So it doesn't make sense to screen the whole population that way. That's why what we're trying to See, can we get this information about people, you know, and, and sort out when they should start? Now, re remember the study, in the study, we ask you if you want to be, uh, if you're willing to be randomized and you, if you're willing to take the recommendation either for annual or personalized, the study will assign you which arm and then you'll get those recommendations. If you feel strongly and have, want to choose, then what you should do is go into the observational arm and choose which one. So if you say, gosh, I only want to screen every year, pick the observational arm and pick annual screening. If you only want the personalized arm, then pick that. But don't, you, you know, that, that's, that's why we organized it because sometimes people aren't willing to be randomized. They want to choose. We understand that. And we can learn from everybody doing that. So that's very important, you know, and, um, and so um, that's, you know, that's, that's the goal. So you should be able to think about that. And I would love to just say that in, you know, as a closing comment is that one of my favorite quotes is a Maya Angelou quote. And she says, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. That's the whole philosophy of the wisdom study. That's what we're trying to do. Only way to do better is to know better. So if everyone participates, we'll all know better and then we can do better. Thank, Thank you so much. Yes, please, Valerie. Oh. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura. That is a great quote. And thank you so much to all of our panelists. Thanks everyone so much for attending. You will get a survey after this. If you have questions, you feel free to follow up via this email. I know there's questions about reaching out to specific panelists and that people at that email will be able to put you in touch with more specific questions. We've also been yeah. tracking all the questions that come through. So we'll do our best to follow up with folks. Oh, um, and, and, one, and, one, and one other thing, Jen, is that if you come from a family with the, where you have a strong family history, like the person that, you know, that Cheryl described at the beginning. Don't wait for this study. Go in and get yourself tested and find out you should be in, in, in an early screening program. So people who have very strong family history of, of breast cancer, you know, even if they don't have a mutation, you can't explain the risk in the family, it should be screening at an earlier age. Yeah, and one thing that we hadn't talked about, uh, you can really get risk from your father's side and too often we neglect yes. to talk about men in these conversations. Black men have very high rates of prostate cancer and they're five times more likely to die from prostate cancer in some communities. And so breast and prostate cancer and sometimes ovarian cancer can run in families or even lung cancer. So the most important thing is as soon as you have breasts, women should learn about their breast health and about the risk factors. And when in doubt, ask your doctor if you should be tested, but don't wait. Wonderful. 
Well, thank you all so much. I think we sort of mentioned early on, wisdom has been designed from the start to bring in many, many stakeholders to think about what we need to do to improve breast cancer screening. And wisdom is ever evolving. It's designed to meet, to, as new science emerges, be able to meet the needs. And there's constantly new research developing. So we wanna hear from you about, about what we can do with this research moving forward. So thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your evening.